a special guest with us tonight. I'd like to introduce the world's leading middleweight contender, the Bronx Bull, the Raging Bull. Let's hear it for the great Jake LaMotta, ladies and gentlemen. I come from the Bronx, and uh, even as a kid, which I was when he really was in his prime, uh, Jake LaMotta was a legend. A lot of the boxers were, of course, in those days. And Jake LaMotta was uh, one of our own. And uh, he was a New York boy, a Bronx boy, and certainly we all identified with him on some level. Bob Chardiff and I uh, produced New York, New York, and uh, while we were in the throes of that production, uh, I constantly saw Bob De Niro walking around with this shop-worn looking book. And uh, he never told me what it was, but he always carried it around. And one day he came over to me and he said, uh, I'd like you to take a look at this book. And um, I looked at it and it was the book on which Raging Bull ultimately was, uh, was based. I, I read the book um, when I was doing 1900 and in Italy and, uh, and I called Marty about it and I said, you know, this book is not so well written, but it's got some heart to it. There's something interesting about the story. So then he got a copy and read it. Uh, I was at Warner Brothers Studio finishing or about to make Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, 1974, I think. And so he gave me the book then and talked about uh, dreaming of doing this character. And at that time, he had in his mind to actually uh, go through the physical transformation. And uh, at that point, we had just come off Mean Streets. We hadn't planned to make that many films together, Bob and I. It just turned out that way. Uh, we seem to relate to the same material. So I read it, and I saw certainly the connection right away. I saw that, you know, I understood immediately the character. To a certain extent, I understood what he was interested in the character. And uh, I like characters like that. It had that resonance for me as the kind of character that I, I would like to see and like to spend time with in a picture, you know, and like to make. So from that point on, he kept checking in with me, and I kept going off in different directions and one of them was Taxi Driver. And then we did New York, New York together, and he was still being serious about Raging Bull. But by that point, I was changing my mind, though. I was no longer really interested. See, I never really understood sports, baseball, football, uh, boxing. Uh, I liked music more, and so by the time I was finishing New York, New York, I was working on The Last Waltz with uh, Robbie Robertson. And in any event, um, we never quite settled on what it was, how we were gonna approach the project, really. And uh, in effect, we had uh, started to work on a script with Mardik Martin, who was a friend of mine who I met at New York University back in uh, the early 60s. And we, so we had worked on Mean Streets together. So they gave me the book uh, as a project to start with. Obviously, I had to start researching this. And that took almost six months. And Bob was with me, I'd say, 50% of the time, meaning we sat through every boxing movie ever made and see how we could improve our project so we don't repeat the cliches. And that, that wasn't enough. So we decided to meet everybody who was involved in the story of Jake LaMara, his ups and downs and his marriage and all that. So one of the first things we did was we flew to Miami and I spent I think three or four days living with Vicky Lamara and getting her to relax and telling me this marvelous, marvelous, realistic story. Nothing major in terms of story turns and events, but a lot of observations that I thought were wonderfully human. And we spent a lot of time with Jake and going over it and what do you think about this scene and you know, and he was at the auditions with the fighters, especially at the gym. He would come down to the gym all the time when I would work out. He and his brother, Joey. So they were always, uh, Jake was a big part of it. And Pete Savage, who was the writer of the book, one of the writers. And um, Pete would be around, a big part of it. Pete was, you know, very instrumental in sort of helping move the thing along. And he became one of the producers with Erwin uh, Winkler and Bob Chartoff. When I finished my research, Bob decided that he wanted to try some of these dialogue in a play. So I actually sat down and I wrote a first act. I've never written a play before, but I thought, what, what's the big deal? 
I always wanted to try and do a play and a movie of the same of the same um, piece simultaneously, but it can be done. It would have been a little hard. So we somehow dropped that after a while. Well, what happened after you know almost two years of working on a project and uh, done so many versions, uh, said, you know, maybe I should really move on. I I'm getting too close. I didn't think I was going to make the film. Quite honestly, I was going off in my own direction and I had my own issues with the work I was doing and my own kind of work, and I was going through my own sort of crisis. And so um, it reached a point where uh, it really came down to De Niro's insistence on doing it. How should I say insistence? More than insistence, it was uh, his persuasion. He was really interested in doing it, and uh, ultimately that led to us asking Paul Schrader to come in and approach the project uh, from an objective point of view. I, I read the script and I, I knew there was something missing. I didn't know what. Um, and I knew I had to do a lot of research. So I hired a, a researcher uh, who worked for Rolling Stone, Stu Urban. And then we met up in uh, Florida and he started giving me the research. And I discovered that uh, there were in fact two fighting Lamato brothers. They were fighters together. They sometimes shared the bill together and that Joey had the gift of gab and was personable, and Jake was socially really quite awkward. And, uh, and they made a, a kind of de facto deal among themselves, which is essentially Joey would manage Jake and get the girls. Jake would get the beatings, and then they split the money. We talked about them, then he said, well, the next big change, he said, would be that you combine the Peter Savage character with the Joey LaMotta character, the brother. And these are characters. These are based on real people. But it's not the real people. Uh, you know, it's, it's a creation that comes out of everybody. But it was dramatically efficient to combine the two characters into one and make it the brother, make it bound by blood. That eliminated a, a certain problem and created others because now you had two brothers and you had certain things to get in, certain facts, certain things that didn't make sense if it's two brothers as opposed to a friend. But it all, you know, anyway, we, we worked it out. Once I had my sibling structure, uh, having an older brother sibling, I knew how to play that. You know, now you're back into classic storytelling. You're back east of Eden, and you just start working all the elements that are involved with a two brother story. I'm a jerk. Yeah. You're a fucking asshole. Hey, what the fuck are you? And uh, we were sort of given freedom to move into Jake's life. And you knew that certain things were happening. There was a family configuration. And beyond that, you were able to fill the glass up with your own fluids. It wasn't a matter of saying, you know, Jake, well, what happened in April? No, it was just a matter of using your imagination and your experience to fill it up. And uh, we would talk to Jake, say, what do you think about this? Jake would say, yeah, you could do, you know. But we were kind of like, took it as far as we could, as far as what we thought it would be, and we make it our own, as you say, and then that's the most you can do. When Schrader came in and gave us the new structure, I got very excited because I saw how uh, he was able to cut right into the center of the story and begin it, in a way, rather than going from the beginning and, and, and uh, doing a linear story, in a way. And so it freed us. Jake and and um, I saw certain things that Schrader liked in it, that Bob had uh, issues with. There was a couple of things he just didn't agree with, totally did not agree with. I thought it was interesting because it was kind of provocative. I wrote a monologue about Jake at the bottom in a cell in solitary. And um, he's trying to masturbate. And in order to get himself aroused, he conjures up the memories of the girlfriend's wives. And sure enough, at the point where He's aroused, it can possibly get some release. The memory turns to crap, and he realizes what a shit he was. And he has to give up that particular fantasy, move on to the next one, <laughs> start all over again. And I think there was maybe three uh, attempts. And finally, after the third attempt, he's, he's so frustrated that uh, he blames it on his hands. He always felt his hands were too small. And uh, smashes his hands against the wall and uh, breaks his knuckles. I thought it was much more interesting than what we had before, but it still didn't fit around what De Niro saw as the character. So I asked Paul to 
try to convince Bob on that. See if get, they could come to a meeting of the minds. If they can't, then I got to really think about it too and see what the hell I was going to do. Marty called me up and said Bob doesn't want to do it. And uh, I said, why not? And I said, you know, it's really, really cool. Scene. It's a long, three, three page monologue. You know, it's really actor's treat. I do remember the masturbation thing, but I don't know where Paul got that, but I, I don't, that had nothing to do with what I remember. Anything about Jake or anything that Marty and I really felt was what the movie, uh, what we were trying to do. As it all turned out, it ended up being the um, I Am Not an Animal uh, sequence <laughs> instead. <laughs> it's gonna be an animal. I'm not an animal. I'm not an animal. Oh, you wanna treat me like this? And then uh, there was so much talk about the uh, changing the script, and there was a meeting at the Sherry Netherland. Uh, where I exploded at Bob and threw the script at him. But, you know, we, we had an argument, I came back, and I worked some more. But, uh, you know, it became clear to Bob and Marty that this next final stage they were headed toward was the one that only they could get to. And so when Marty shot it, I sent him a telegram to clarify this, and essentially said, you know, Jake did it his way, and I did it my way. Now, you do it your way, so that he wouldn't feel that he was somehow um, upsetting me by changing the script. In any event, um, I still hadn't found my connection to the material. I was also in a very dis very destructive state, and I didn't really, I wasn't satisfied with the work I was doing on New York, New York, and a couple of other things, and I felt I was losing something from the passion that produced a Taxi Driver, and I certainly was losing connection with the passion that produced Mean Streets, and that was my concern, my fear, could I ever feel strongly about something again, and it, it went back and forth, it went back and forth, and so um, it reached a point where, uh, I think it was September of 78, I was hospitalized. <laughs> I felt like, uh, well, I'd sort of somehow hit a certain bottom in a way, in many different ways. I was just in this room for like 10 or 12 days. I didn't go out of the room. I just felt that whatever I was uh, railing against <laughs> had, had, had run its course in a way. And now, uh, now I wake up and I'm still there. So now what am I going to do? And when De Niro came to visit me, a number of people came. And uh, De Niro pointed out he just, he just was very concerned because he said, look, you'd be so great at this material, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and as he was speaking, I said, okay. But I still wasn't quite sure I wanted to make it. I really didn't know that world. I mean, I knew the world around it, but I didn't know the ring. I didn't understand what the ring was and is. I mean, I couldn't interpret it for my life. But I think at that time, of course, I was taking it too literally um, because ultimately I came to understand that the ring is everywhere and it depends how much of a fighter you are in life. And the hardest opponent in the ring that you have is yourself. And that's what I understood but didn't articulate ultimately with anyone, really, when we were making the film. And basically what, I, what had happened, I think, was that I was disappointed in myself, disappointed in things I had done. And I had to pull myself back together. You're either going to say sorry for yourself or you're going to get going. And with this material, having had his persuasion over a period of six years, let's say, of constantly coming back with it, look at it, look at it, think about it, look at it, think about it, I started to connect with the material and certainly with the character. I mean, I only kind of realized it years later, but I kind of found myself in there somewhere, you know, and felt the passion that um, I felt for Mean Streets, let's say. It suddenly started to pick up, particularly when uh, De Niro requested that both of us go away. We went to St. Martin after Paul had, Schrader had written his final version. We went down and just reworked it. So we came back to New York, and we brought the script back to uh, Irwin Winkler, and uh, he was pleased with it, and Irwin could tell you the rest. He knows all the details of the business, how we almost got the film made, how we didn't get it made. One of the uh, uh, successes Charlie Winkler had at that point was Rocky. Rocky came out in 1976 and was a tremendous success, both financially and, and artistically. Won Academy Award for Best Picture. And United Artists was very anxious for us to make another Rocky. And we owned the copyright to Rocky with United Artists. And we said that we really weren't that interested in, in, in making another Rocky, which was not particularly true. We were interested in making another Rocky. Uh, but we wanted to make Raging Bull. And we kind of used the weight of Rocky to get Raging Bull made. I guess they thought that we could pull it off to make a, yet another boxing film. 
I think when Marty suggested doing it in black and white, and then when they read the script, which uh, uh, had more than one uh, curse word in it, at a time when people weren't quite used to that, uh, some doubts did arrive. There was a great deal of resistance about making this script. And Stephen Bach and David Fields, who were both heads of the studio at the time, who were going up to meet with Marty, Bob, and I to tell us that they weren't going to make the movie. So uh, they came up and they, they, they questioned us about uh, the character. And I remember that, I don't know who said it, but somebody said something negative about the LaMotta character being something like a cockroach. And De Niro said, uh, he's not a cockroach. There were negative things about him, but at the same time, I'm curious about people like that who have this negative perception about them. And really, it's, life is much more complex. I guess the sincerity or the, uh, the, the conviction that De Niro had when he said that uh, seemed to convince them of whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, also, that they were concerned the film was going to be made in black and white, and I pointed out there were five films being made in color that year, Rocky II, um, Matilda, the boxing kangaroo, and uh, the main event, and one other boxing picture that was coming out. And they were all in color, and I said, this would be different. And so they bought that. But it was a different period, too. It was a different time. The directors had a lot of power, especially in a combination where, you know, you work with a certain actor all the time, and it was a special team. So in any event, that sort of thing that ultimately got the picture made. Well, the casting was done by Sis Corman, and uh, basically, if there's a lead in the picture, I usually have the actor in the room with the person as they come to read or meet very often, because I like to see the two together. I like to see if they have any uh, chemistry together. Maybe it's hard to tell when an actor coming into reading cold or just having a day to prepare for something. But something happens, and uh, it, I, people have got to be working together. My thing is, ultimately, it's got to be with the actors. There's got to be the faces on the screen and the way they interact, you know. I want everybody to fit. If they don't fit, then to keep them apart until they're in the scene so that they can play their animosity, <laughs> you know? Um, in any event, we just basically went through that process. Tell me the truth. I just told you the truth. I tell you the truth the first time. You don't have to ask me again. I never do that. I always tell you the truth. If I did it, you would know. Well, Joe, I had seen in a movie called The Death Collector, and, uh... He immediately struck me. I said, Marty, you got to see this guy. This movie's so Sis Corman found Joe. He was just living in the Bronx and working in this restaurant and people he knew. So we went up there one night for dinner and had dinner with him and went through the whole thing. And then Joe came and read a couple of times. And we felt that Joe was so interesting for the part and so terrific, you know, that he was just too special to not use him. I had no career. I was I had given up on acting. Uh, I was a child actor since five, so even though I had given up on acting and didn't want anything to do with it anymore, it was the prospect of doing a movie with those two was exciting to me. We liked his manner and his uh, sense of being comfortable. Do me a favor, huh? Do something for me. Just put your hands up. I want to show you something. Put your hands up. What the fuck is so hard about that? Hey, Joe, well, you don't understand. When I met the real Joey, it was very funny because uh, he was looking at me from head to toe and walking around me. And I remember saying to him, well, they tried to get Robert Redford to play you, but he was busy, so I'm playing you. You crazy. Why don't you hit him with a bat, huh? She stole my wife. Yeah, but I want you to she want to take. I hit her enough. What am I supposed Kill to do? Kill the fuck. Hey, well, the way he looked and the way he walked and all, I, pick, I made a lot of those choices myself when I met him. And I always give my characters a walk way of talking, a way of walking. And I always do that because it helps me get into a character better than, than using too much of myself because I tend to, to bring myself into a lot of roles. You know what you should do? Try a little more fucking, a little less eating. You won't have troubles upstairs in your bedroom and you won't pick it out on me and everybody else. And then we were looking for uh, Vicky and Joe said he knew a couple of kids and one day he brought up Kathy Moriarty. Joe recommended her. Joe said, I know this girl who's up in uh, the Bronx or in some club I see her around, you know, and he found her and he recommended that we meet her, so we did. Didn't really know very much about professional acting. I just knew about high school acting and, uh, and dinner theater and just a little bit I had learned. I wanted to go to acting school, so I was working and trying to save up enough money to go. But Joe Pesci, or one of Joe Pesci's friends, had seen my picture and uh, said, you know, they're doing these open casting calls, which I was looking into to begin with, and I sent my picture in and Sis Corman had called me. I went in and I read for Sis and I went over them a couple of times and then she'd give me another scene to read. 
And then she said, I want you to meet Bobby and Marty, two, two gentlemen. And I said, yeah, okay. I knew she was young, but you couldn't say she looks like a young kid. I mean, she had a composure, which I didn't know was either total confidence or complete panic that she was covering. In either case, it's good. <laughs> so, you know, uh, because if it was panic, could fool me. I feel like I'm a prisoner. I can't walk. I look at somebody the wrong way, I get smacked. She read a few lines, said a few things, sounded right. The voice was very interesting, we thought. Look, I am right. I'm tired of having to turn around and having both of you up my ass all the time. Well, she was great because she was young. She had a great presence, good instincts, uh, authentic. And that was a very important part of the whole thing. Ultimately, we did a screen test. We decided to actually do a real screen test in 35 millimeter. I didn't know the technical aspect of movie making. And all these people were around. And I remember uh, Marty saying to me, okay, Kathy, you ready? And I was like, yeah. And he said, okay, action. And I kind of looked around and said, Kathy, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for everybody to leave. And Marty kind of went paler than he already is. And he said, well, Kathy, they're not leaving. And I said, oh, well, then why didn't you just tell me that? And I said, all right, I'm ready. And that was it. And then Bob threw a few improvisatory remarks to her. And she just wasn't shaken by them at all. In fact, slapped him right back, in a sense, with the dialogue. You know, just, just did it. Because she understood intrinsically what the, his character's like. She just knew it. And so once she finished the test, we kind of knew. We didn't, have to, we didn't even have to screen it. We kind of knew that's, that's the air he wanted to go. There was another wonderful young actress who was coming at the same time to uh, audition. And when she arrived, he said, I don't even want to put you through it. And they called me the next day, and they said, you have the part. I said, OK. Hi, Joey. How you doing? All right, what are you doing? Yeah, not too much. What are you doing? Oh, are you far? I couldn't do research on the part of Vicky LaMotta because I would probably try and portray her, her feelings, which that wasn't what the movie was about. It was how he saw her, what he believed. So I couldn't meet her, which was a difficult thing for me to understand being my first movie, not having a lot of experience, not having really any experience. So I can't really do research on the person other than uh, Robert De Niro would be showing me the pictures and home movies, how she would walk. You know, just certain characteristics about her without meaning her. I probably understood it much, many years later that it was for my own good. But um, scene by scene, we'd kind of dissect it and just work on it and improvise. They taught me how to improvise. They taught me how to listen. They taught me how to listen and how to be part of the conversation. So it wasn't read your lines and what was in the script, but to become that character, you know the other character, so that you could always respond. You make me laugh. You think it's easy? Why don't you talk to him? You know what to say. Tell him. You know I can't talk to him. Well, why can't you talk to him? Because he don't like me. Yeah, nobody likes you. You ought to be used to it. Joe found Frank Vincent. Joe was an old friend of Frank Vincent's. They would perform at weddings, apparently, in the 70s, and they would sing, and they, uh, they had to sort of act together. It was pretty interesting. And so they also had a great rapport. Joe was a musician who was playing in clubs, different bands. I met him because I was playing in a club that was in his locale, and um, one of the members that I had, well, my band was leaving, and I needed a replacement, and uh, I asked Joe if he wanted to work, and he said, yeah. And that was 4th of July, 1969. And by Labor Day, we were partners. We just clicked, and um, it just, it took right off. Oh, stop it! Suck your fucking eyes out! I had done uh, one independent film before Raging Bull because I wasn't, you know, uh, an actor, actor that was trying to pursue that. But I met Joe in some place socially. He said, you know, he said, look, they can't find a salvo. You ought to come up and see them. So we set it up and I went. And then I had an audition and Joe came. And Joe and I walked through the scene where we were walking in the street and we just improvised the whole scene. And uh, three days later, I got a call for a uh, screen test. I did the screen test and I went away. I was going from San Diego to Vegas. And I called Sis Corman from the desert. She said, you got the job. I'll see you later, Joey. We were criticized, too, by some friends of mine who were actors, said, you know, it's a bad thing to do, bring non-actors into films, because these are parts that can be done by actors and you're hurting us by taking away work and that sort of thing, and who knows what they're going to do in the future. You know, it's, it's just the way I saw things, and uh, I was sorry about that 
that people felt that way, but I didn't see it that way. And neither did Bob. And so that's how it developed. <laughs>